All right, everyone. Hope everybody is doing well. Thanks, everybody, for being patient with me. I want to take a few seconds and just get an audio check and just make sure everything is working as it should. So as soon as I see a few comments that say the audio is working, I'll be good. Fantastic. Well, first off, thanks, everyone, for being here and joining me on the second session of these mentorship videos. And as I said, the goal of these videos, the first one was getting started. This one is going to be about the market cycle. And overall, to get into that, there's three things I want everybody to be thinking about regarding the market cycle. I kind of see this as three phases. One, we've got to first understand the market cycle and what it is. Then we have to understand breakouts followed by leg counting. If we can understand those three pieces, we all have a really good shot of understanding trading and how it operates. So with that, let me begin by sharing a couple of slides. Go ahead and ask questions. I'm going to reserve questions at the very end. So if there are questions, I will look through that towards the end of our session here. With that, give me just one second. And thanks again, everybody, for joining. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So as I said, the, the agenda for today, the first portion is going to be the market cycle, which is the foundation of trading. Next, we'll talk about the parts of the market cycle, market cycles, and how they reset with the breakout, some easy methods to identify the market cycle, some example of market cycles on a chart followed by Q&A. Okay, so part one, I'm going to go ahead and remove myself because I'm going to be in the way of the text. So why does the market cycle matter? Well, from the first power from the first bullet point, it's the foundation of trading. And we'll explain I'll explain more of that as we go on. But overall, in order to understand why the market cycle matters, We've really got to be thinking about these three pieces right here. We have to know how to identify market cycle on a chart in hindsight. Next, we have to learn what a breakout is because a breakout explains the market cycle. And then the third is we have to understand leg, set, leg counting. Okay, so the, the market cycle, it's the foundation of trading. In order to understand the market cycle, we have to understand what the goal of a market is. Who can tell me what the goal of a market is? When we think about the market, we have to ask ourselves, there's a fundamental reason as to why a market exists. And if we don't understand that reason, then we're trading something without the understanding of why we should trade it. The goal and the reason a market exists, no matter what market is, corn, a gallon, milk, you know, I always kind of joke, what's the difference between a gallon of milk at a grocery store and Apple? And the only difference is whatever people are willing to pay. It's, it's still, it's always going to be buyers and sellers coming together. On every market, no matter what it is, there's some level that's too expensive and there's some level that's too cheap. And the market is going to probe up and down in search of those levels. Eventually, there's going to be news that changes it and the fundamentals change and the market has an upside breakout. So what happens at the fair price? As I just said on the prior chart, it's gonna probe up and down, and then suddenly there's a big news item and everybody agrees that the price is wrong. But since the market's goal is to always be in search of a fair price, when there's price discovery, it's going to test that price repeatedly. And its goal is to create a tight trading range. And when it finds that tight trading range, it eventually moves on. Okay. The last piece to really understand regarding this is the goal of a market. It's going to force traders to always trade. That's, that is just the reality of trading. If you're going to buy a house, if you're going to buy anything, you need buyers and sellers together. 
if you don't have buyers and sellers, if you don't have transparency in a market, in other words, a lot of transactions back and forth, it's going to be very difficult and you're not going to know what a, what the fair price is. You know, it's kind of like if, if any of you follow fixed income products, there's plenty of bonds out there, especially municipal bonds where, you know, maybe it's a municipal bond for a school. It's going to be much more difficult to figure out what the overall price is. So now, now that we understand the foundation of the market, it's price discovery to find the fair price and oscillate around the, price, the fair price and bring together buyers and sellers. Next, let's talk about the parts of the market cycle. So there's two pieces to a market cycle. We have a trend and a trading range. And I know what you're thinking. When you think about a trend or a trading range, what about a channel? Well, you know, doesn't, a, doesn't the market cycle have breakout, channel, and trading range? That's true. With a market cycle, the market cycle, I think about it as two things. It's either trending or it's in a trading range. And a channel is the in-between. Because when you look at a channel, it is trending behavior, but after the channel ends, it's a trading range. So anyways, market cycle, the key thing that I want everyone to understand about the market cycle, it's a never ending cycle. It can never be broken. It goes sideways. You get a strong bear breakout and maybe it channels down for a couple of legs and then it starts going sideways again. The other piece with the market cycle, it's always trending and it's always in a trading range. So you have a bull trend there, bear trends here. So it's always doing one or the other. Here, bear trends, the earlier slide we saw bull trends. And then here, trading ranges. Most of the time, it's doing a little bit of both, which is what makes the market confusing. That's why you hear Al all the time say 90% of the time, you can buy and sell in either direction and make money. 10% of the time, it's like this. If this was, you know, if there was a trading range up here and we're getting a very strong downside breakout here below a lot of bars to the left, it would have gone a lot lower. Within the market cycle, it's always going to be a combination of one of these four patterns. The exact opposite would obviously be the bear case. The market's going to either be a bull breakout, bull channel, broad channel, or a trading range. Now, the key with understanding the market cycle is the higher time frame always has a greater impact on the lower time frame. So this might be the five-minute chart today. It's not, you know, it wasn't exactly today, but if it was today. But if this is the daily chart or a 60-minute chart, this five-minute price action over here on the trading range is going to have a short influence on the market. And I'll talk more about that with minor and major surprises. So each pattern, one to two bars, could be 20 or more bars. Now, the first key, the key with understanding the market cycle is this right here, a breakout. It's the fundamental piece of trading. A breakout can be one bar, it can be many bars. But a breakout is what resets the market cycle. So we think of it as Breakout, it's the first part of a market cycle. And that's true. But technically, a breakout is breaking out of a, of a previous market cycle. And the end of a market cycle, the end state of a market cycle, is always going to be a trading range. Once you have a breakout, you get a pullback. So what does that pullback create? Who can tell me what a pullback creates in the market cycle? That's exactly it. A pullback is going to create the channel phase of the market cycle, and we can see it right here. The key with understanding channels is channels are going to be the evolution into a trading range. I think of a channel as a transition point between a trend and a trading range. Again, because the markets are fractal, this small pullback trend, which I'll show some examples later on, this small pullback rally here, if it was, let's say, We've had a lot. If, what if this just continued up? This whole thing would be a breakout. But anyways, we had a breakout. 
here. We have a channel here. We know what's coming up next, trading range. So it's the way I think about it is phase one of the market cycle, phase two of the market cycle, which is the pullback phase, and then the channel phase, and then phase three, which is the trading range phase. Now, with the market cycle, there's a few things we have to think about. With any piece of the market cycle, there's inertia, the 80% rule. 80% of the time, the market's going to continue doing what it's doing. If the market is in a strong trend, in this case, you could say it's a bear trend. You could say it's a broad bear channel. 80% of the time, it's going to remain in a broad bear channel. The more it behaves like a trading range, the more, in other words, the deeper the pullbacks, the faster it's going to evolve into a trading range. And you can see all these reversal ups, they continue to fail, continue to fail, continue to fail. Now, why 80%? That's because typically after about, five, let's say, five major reversal attempts, by major reversal attempts, I just mean five in a small pullback trend or fairly, or a channel that's starting to get overlap. After five pretty strong moves, they typically fail and lead to a trading range. That's why 80%. Inertia in a trading range, exact same logic. All of these moves, 80% of the time, they're going to fail. One of the things with the trading range, and I'm going to talk more later on about each one of the pieces of the market cycle, but we've got to understand the whole market cycle in order to break it down piece by piece. The key thing about a trading range, it's not, there's not uniform uniformity to breakouts. It's climactic behavior. It's parabolic behavior. If you think about math, it, there's, not a, there's not a gradual slope in the momentum. It's sudden surges that end. Binary decisions. That is probably one of the most important things to understand with trading. Whenever you have a market, whenever, whenever you're looking at the market, you should always be thinking in terms of binary decisions. And that's one thing I'm going to talk further and further and more and more about in the later mentorship sessions. Everything's a binary decision. It's a trend or a trading range, breakout or channel, channels tight or broad, it's major or minor. You can break everything down into decision trees. And you have to in order to be able to make decisions fast enough, especially if you're trading a five minute chart. Okay. The market cycle. It resets with a breakout. It's probably one of the most important things to understand about a market cycle. There's two types of breakouts I want to categorize. One is a surprise breakout, and the other is a minor surprise. We've all seen this in the video course. So what's a major surprise? I like to think of a major surprise as something that's going to influence the market in a really big way. This was the FOMC report we had. I think it was the, I believe it was the most recent FOMC report that we had, the most recent FOMC meeting. And the market broke out to the upside for a very large amount. It broke, we had a trading range. There was a bull channel down here. It broke far to the upside. This breakout is such a surprise. It's going to influence the market for the next several bars, the next, the rest of the day and probably the following day. So this is resetting the market cycle. It's ending this previous market cycle and it's starting over a new market cycle. In other words, it's price discovery, fundamentals change. And based on the fundamentals of the market changing, price discovery now has to occur in order for everybody to agree what the next price is. And we can see here's the next several days. There was the FOMC day followed by the next two trading days in this blue box. And we can see what happened. I mean, obviously the blue box formed a trading range. So who can tell me, what is this right here? What did I say the goal of a market is? You should always be thinking about that. The goal of a market is not to have strong breakouts. The goal of a market is what? Exactly, it's to find the fair price. It's to find, it's to bring together buyers and sellers so everybody can agree on balance. The market wants as tight of a spread as possible. It wants to make it as difficult as possible for traders to make money because if it does that, it's done its job. You should be able to buy a product and sell it for roughly the same price. Obviously, 
I'm saying that within, you know, the more buyers and sellers you have together, the closer the price will remain. Obviously, prices fluctuate. Now, here's another example of a major surprise. We had a rally here. This was following late in a channel. This was back in 20, early 2023, I believe. But this was early 2020, late 2022, early 2023. We had a bull breakout of a bull channel. And you can see we had this really big bear bar. And if you were long during this bull bars right here, you're looking at that bar and say, wow, that's really painful. Al calls that a pain trade. That's surely that's going to shift the market and make this a major surprise. So when I think major surprise, I think reset the market cycle in a big way. And therefore, no matter what we had over here, we have a new breakout, new market cycle. So bear breakout. Next phase is a channel. Channel is probably going to last for several bars, which it did a lot of overlap. When the channel occurs, the next phase you think about is trading range. The key with, with trading ranges is to understand the key with channels is to understand that the market can last a very long time before the trading range begins. And you can see the market rallied all the way back up to here, the beginning of the channel, either here or here. Okay, next, we've talked about major surprises. Let's talk about minor surprises. Minor surprises happen all day, every day on every chart a minor surprise i like to think about it as it res it resets the market cycle in a obvious minor way now what does minor mean minor can mean five bars it can mean four bars it can mean 10 bars but the key with minor reversals is that there's a larger context in play in other words there's a larger market cycle in play we had this bull channel so the market's in a bull channel it's going to evolve into a trading range. Makes perfect sense. Minor reversals have minor market cycles that resume the previous larger market cycle. So we have a minor bear breakout. This is a breakout. Therefore, it's resetting a market cycle. It's breaking out of something. It should get a second leg. We have a second leg down here. So it's the channel phase. But since the market cycle, this is minor relative to the bars to the left, the second leg will probably be somewhat symmetrical to the breakout, this orange box. However, once you get the second leg, it's probably going to reverse and form a trading range, which it did over here. And you can see the market continued to work. It continued to be influenced by the larger market cycle. <clears throat> so the next thing I want to talk about is methods of identifying the market cycle when you're trading a five minute chart really when you're trading any chart you have to have a way to identify the market cycle and you have to have a way to i do it to identify it relatively quickly if you're trading a five minute chart you do not have the time to pull up al's book and look through all the ways to identify market cycle you've got to know what you're doing as you're trading so what's one way we can identify the market cycle? An easy way is look at a higher time frame. Now, why is that? Who can tell me why looking at a higher time frame makes sense? Why would we look at a higher time frame to understand the market cycle? I hinted at it earlier, and it has to do with major and minor surprises. So who can tell me? It's a fractal world. That's a great example. So great job. I'll take that answer. The reason why you want to look at a higher time frame is the higher time frame market context is going to influence the lower time frame. So if I look at a one minute chart, obviously, or let's keep it more simple than that. If I look at a five minute chart, the 60 minute chart is going to heavily influence the five minute chart. So one thing I do, if I'm trading a five minute chart, I'm always thinking about a 15 minute chart. So if I see this big sell off here, tight channel, and then I see a rally two legs up and I look at that and I say, yeah, it's breaking above the moving average. You know, maybe this is a reversal and the start of 
an opposite trend in the formation of a trading range. One thing I'll do, if I'm ever in doubt, flip to a 15 minute chart. And then I look at this and I say, yeah, it's three big bear bars or four big bear bars. First reversal up is probably gonna fail. And it led to a channel down. Now, if, if one way to identify the market cycle is using a higher time frame, what's another way we can identify the market cycle? Who can guess? So I'm gonna give maybe 10 seconds for people to type an answer and tell me and tell me what's an easy way, and that's the key, easy way to identify a market cycle. What do we all have on our charts? You can look to the left, but that's kind of discretionary. Someone said breakouts, someone said reversals, leg counting, all of that's discretionary. What do, there we go. Great job. EMA, the moving average. That's one way a moving average can be very helpful. There's a few ways we can use a moving average. One, right here. If you're looking at a sell-off and you look to the market and a lot of bars are above the, below the moving average in this case, and you see a big bull bar closing above it, look to the left. If the market's been below the moving average for 15, 20 bars, then there's a good chance that that bull breakout needs to get followed through. So what I like to see is a strong breakout breaking far above the bars to the left. I want to see a strong breakout and a strong follow through bar. I'm going to pull up. I'm going to take a second because this is a good time to do so to pull up a trading rate. A, I want to pull up TradeStation and I want to show for those of you that listened to Al's podcast recently. He talked about the December 20th breakout. I'm going to pull that up really quick. So here's December 20th. And you can see trading range price action. And here's a moving average. 60 minute moving average. We've been far away from it. And we broke far below it with big bars and a lot of urgency that increased the probability that the market was going to go lower. Let's find another example. Lots of bars above the moving average. Notice how the market never closed, could never get consecutive closes below the moving average. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. But what I want to see is a bull bar and a strong follow through above the moving average, or I want to see a collection of bars above the moving average. And here's another example. If you're ever in doubt, of this, if this is a leg in a trading range or a tight bear channel, go to a higher time frame. And the reason why that matters is when you look at a higher time frame and it's clearly trending and the market cycle is very clear, it's going to influence the lower time frame in a bigger way. So, for example, if I look at today's price action here, here's today's price action, a lot of lines, but this is overall trading range. If I go to a 15 minute chart, we can see, and I talked about this some in the trading room today. If I look at a 15 minute chart, what is changing about the market cycle? Now I look at the market cycle from January 11th to now, and I say, and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, yeah, it's still a market side. It's still within a large trading range. So nothing's really changed. Maybe it's a triangle, but it's the same. That is a warning that the higher time frames are also in a market cycle which is going to that the higher time frames, excuse me, not market cycle, the higher time frames are within a trading range. So if the 60 minute charts in a trading range, the 15 minute charts in a trading range, and the five minute chart is in, is going to probably have a lot of trading range price action. And this is that same day I'll talked about on December the 20th of 2023. And we can see it right here. Here's the 60 minute moving average, this dashed line. And when you look at the market and it hasn't touched the moving average in a whole lot of bars in a lot of days, and when the daily chart has not touched the moving average in a lot of bars or a lot of days, there's a greater risk of big sell-offs. And you can see, once the market got a little bit of momentum, it quickly vacuumed down to the moving average and went a lot lower. So now I'm going to take some time and I'm going to go over the past week or two 
and really talk through the market cycle and how I would identify it. And afterwards, I'll take a look at some questions. While I'm talking through the market cycle, I will take a look at questions and review them. So feel free to ask questions. So when any open, there's one thing we have to think about. There's a few things we always want to think about on the open. Who can tell me what's one or two things to consider regarding the market cycle? And remember, market cycle, another word for that is also context. What's one thing to think about on the open of every day? What do we always talk about? On the open, you want to look for the bars to the left. So how do we identify the bars to the left? We take the low of the prior day and the high of the prior day. Why is that? Because most of the time, the market is going to go above or below one of those, either the high or the low of the day. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a second and I'm going to turn this screen off and turn on a bar counter. So some people are saying you can look at the pre-market. You have others saying the opening print, which is the first couple of bars of the day, close of yesterday. Did the market have a gap? All of that is true. All those are really good answers. So here we go. First bar of the day, big bull bar. And look what it did. It broke below yesterday's low, the prior day's low. And it reversed up in a big way. What's the one thing I say on the open? Wait for 6 to 12 bars. The reason why is most of the time on any open, the market's going to go sideways for several bars. And typically, it's going to form a trading range. So what, what do we look for on the open? a breakout of the opening range. And look right here, bar seven, big bull bar, breaking out of this opening range. However, always look to the left. It's easy to see a big bull bar and think, oh, that's a major surprise. It's gonna have a major impact on the market. And it might, it is a surprise. And you could argue, maybe it is a major surprise. But whenever you see a big bar, always look to the left. And what do we see? We had a spike down, we had a pullback, and a channel phase. So it's possible this is the channel. You can say that's the channel. We broke below the channel here, reversed back into the channel, and guess what we're doing? We're testing the top of a channel. And if we are testing the top of a channel, there's a greater risk that this may actually just become a buy vacuum test of the top of the channel. So spike, pullback, channel phase. Big bull bar on bar seven. This is resetting the market cycle. Remember, it is a, it's a breakout. Breakouts reset the market cycle. So next, what do I wanna think about? What I wanna think about is this right here. Let me turn the screen off. I wanna pull up something on my computer and share it. So we'll just take one second. There we go. 
turn the screen back on. So we have a big bull bar. And whenever I'm thinking of a breakout, every breakout, I like to think of every breakout as kind of a miniature market cycle. And remember, the market cycle is this right here. So we have a, pull up a whiteboard here. We have a breakout. followed by a channel, which follows a trading range. And that happens on all of these bars. And when we look at this breakout right here, we see the market rallied on bar seven and eight. That's the breakout. And then nine is a pullback. So what is the pullback phase of any breakout? It's the start of a channel. So we have a breakout, pullback, start of a channel. The pullback grew further. And who can tell me what's bar 15 and 16? So what is this? It's a trading range, exactly. And what is the trading range the completion of? It's the completion of a possible market cycle. So by definition, you can argue bar seven, the breakout of bar seven is complete because the goal of bar seven, the goal of any breakout is price discovery. And so we have a breakout here in sideways trading. Whenever you have sideways trading, the breakout loses effect. That's what's most important to understand. And because of that, if I just take a screenshot of this we're going to see how this goes and add that right there we can see that we have a breakout right here now this breakout can either form a measured move up or down and it can either move this down a little bit So we can see that this breakout can either it can rally and go all the way up for a measured move like so or can rally form a double top and instead the market can sell off all the way back down because this is in a trading range now. So right now we're in a trading range, the market cycle is complete and it's waiting for a new breakout. So trading range price action and then what happened right there? That's a breakout. Now, minor surprise, if you think about it, a major surprise, in other words, a surprise breakout, if we go back to this slide right here, Every surprise breakout begins as a minor breakout and it grows. Here, it's enough of a surprise. It's probably going to influence the market for the next four, five, maybe six, seven bars. But then something important happens. We're getting follow through. This is a channel down, but channels that are tight on higher time frames they lead to what? They lead to stronger breakouts. They lead to breakouts on a higher time frame. So now maybe this whole thing is the breakout. Maybe we have a trading range. We're breaking out below this range and we have to get a measured move down. And then we can see tight channel, tight channel, bear breakout. But I thought channels, bear channels, I thought they lead to bull flags and get upside breakouts. They do. However, if the higher time frame, whenever you get a tight bear channel, the higher time frame is a breakout and there's a greater risk of a downside breakout like so. And when that happens, the market, what does it have to do? It has to get its own spike, small spike, pullback and channel down. You'll see that on almost every climactic bar most of the time. Even though these bars are climactic and probably exhaustion, look what happens. 
it still led to a channel. But you look at the breakout on 32 and you think, well, maybe it failed, even though it did get almost a measured move down. But it still got a spike pullback channel and then a failure. So even look at this bar right here, bar 58. 58 is a surprise. So who can tell me? Look at that bar. It's a breakout. And I like to categorize breakouts as two things. When we think about a breakout, so breakouts are what? What am I going to say? Two things. There's two types of breakouts. Weak or strong. Juan, you're right, but what's another word for weak or strong? Breakouts are... Fill in the blank. They are major or minor. The more major the breakout is, the more you can expect the influence of the market to last all day. So when we see a breakout that's major all day and possibly tomorrow, so and possibly the next day, the more it's minor, the more you can expect the market to last maybe three to five bars, depending on the context. So when you have a minor breakout, and remember, breakouts are surprises. That's the same thing as a breakout. So a minor breakout, three to five bars. Whenever you have a minor breakout, the overall market cycle is most important. So the overall market cycle is more important when you have a major and minor breakout. So Ivan is asking, how do you distinguish between a major and minor breakout? Well, who can, who can tell Ivan? So who can put in the chat, what's the difference between major and minor breakouts? So we look at 58. What are the characteristics? Is 58 major or minor? Juan says, breaking support and resistance, follow through. Let's go back to our PowerPoint slide and let's look at this and let's think about the characteristics of this major surprise. So whenever we have a major surprise like this, So a breakout that is I'm going to write this down and I'll make a PDF of it and give it to everybody. We have a breakout that looks like this. We can call this a major surprise breakout. And when we have this, there's one characteristic that I like to think about with major surprise breakouts. And that characteristic is right over here. So I'm going to put it over here. It's a major change in market cycle. So what does that mean exactly? When there's a major change in the market 
cycle, the market is undoing a lot of bars to the left. In order to have this right here, in order to have a major change in the market cycle, you have to influence many bars to the left. So you have to influence many bars to the left. So let's look at this for a minute. Here, bull breakout closing above a lot of bars to the left. Let's find a recent major surprise breakout. What about this sell-off? Is this a major or a minor surprise? Well, whenever I'm trying to decide that, I look to the left. Here, this, the market went from bar two, let's say, all the way to here, so seven bars, six or seven bars, and we're closing below an entire day. So any bull that bought anywhere yesterday and is still long is holding a losing position. That's a major surprise. It's changing the market cycle. When I look at a chart and I ask myself, okay, is this, is the market cycle in any way a bull breakout? Is this any way influence the market? It is. When in doubt, assume that the market is, that it's a minor surprise and it's going to have a couple of legs. But when you can look at the market here, and I'm going to go to, this was the 11th, so I'm going to go to 1 slash 11 slash 24. Look at a 15 minute chart. And you can see, when you, whenever you see a breakout that looks like this, closing below a lot of bars in a relatively short period of time, you know that the first reversal up is probably going to fail. So next, let's take a look at a minor surprise. What about bar, but before we go there, let's look at today. What about bar 19? Is 19 a major or is it a minor surprise? Who can tell me? 19, this bar right here. Is this major or minor? Yeah, it's probably going to be... You can argue it's a minor reversal. And it's a big enough bar that it is probably going to lead. It's going to influence the market. So it is minor, but it's also pretty big. And whenever you get a, whenever you get a reversal that is not necessarily changing the market cycle it's it's making it a trading range but it's not breaking above or below all the bars to the left you can get a very deep pullback but minor reversals can often last for a lot of bars so while it is minor it's also a little bit major and when be, and because of that when i look at this bar it makes me think that it's slightly a major reversal and i say that in terms of it's not necessarily like this right here, where it's going to influence the next several days, but it's strong enough that it's going to make the market a trading range. So if we rally even up to here, guess what's going to happen? It's probably going to be a trading range and lead to more sideways trading and even get a second leg down. What about this bar, bar 26? Who can tell me? Is that a major or minor reversal? It's probably more of a minor reversal. And the reason it's more of a minor reversal is it's a big bar. And you can argue that it's a big bar and it's going to get a second leg. But it's not really reversing a lot of bars to the left today and it got sideways pretty much a small second leg down here maybe here and reversed up but when we look at today this bar 
is reversing down below a lot of bars to the left. Now, just because you get a major, just because you get a minor surprise that's rather big, does not mean that the market is going to break far below it. So I want to talk about a few things regarding the market cycle. So let me pull up the whiteboard here. Call these the market cycle rules. Now you can call them rules, you can call them guidelines, whatever your preference is. Rule number one of the market cycle is when you're unsure, it's best to assume that the market is in a trading range. Assume trading range and wait. The next one is use the EMA. So if the market is 20 plus, if the market is 15 to 20 bars above. EMA, what do you think you should do? Do not sell. And the opposite, if it's bullish, if there's 15, so we'll just write, if there's 15 to 20 bars below the EMA, do not buy. So let's take a look at some examples. Now, does what I'm saying make sense? And more importantly, is what does what whatever you're what you're hearing me say, do you feel like you can apply it to a chart? I'm gonna give that a couple seconds because I want to know that answer. The key with this information, you got to learn it and you got to know how to apply it to a chart. Here, a lot of bars above the moving average. It's easy to look right here and think, oh, it's a parabolic wedge. Of course, I should sell below bar 16. Now, what am I going to say right here? What did we just talk about? From bars 1 to 16. When you're deciding the market cycle, what's the number? What's the first thing you should use? There's two things to look at. One, use the chart in front of you. Look at the moving average. We're above a lot of bars in the moving average. It's probably going to be a trading range. Number two, if you're still in doubt, look at a higher time frame. So even though you look to the left and you say, yeah, it's a failed breakout of yesterday's high, and it very well could be. It's parabolic wedge, one, two, maybe three, or one, two, three. So here is the wedge. When you're ever in doubt and you see a big bear bar, it's always okay to exit the trade here and wait for more bars. But when the market is above a lot of bars to the left, always assume that the market is strong and it's going to lead to a trading range at best and not a bear trend. And what you have to realize is it takes a lot of energy to break below the moving average, or it takes a lot of energy to make the market into a bear trend. And you can see the bears tried, but 18 and 19 is not enough to undo the bull trend. It's enough to make the market possibly form a trading range, but trading ranges often form continuation.
And you can see what happened. The market went sideways, could not break below the moving average. So in order to understand the market cycle, we have to think through what is needed to, what do you really need in order to create a trading range, especially after a trending environment? So I'm going to move this over to here. So here's another guideline to really think about. If the market is 20 plus bars above What do we need? If the market is 20 or plus bars above the EMA, what do we need to sell? So what do we need right here? Market's 20 plus bars above the EMA, 20 plus bars above the EMA. What do we need in order to sell? Exactly. We need a major trend reversal so we need a major trend reversal that's exactly it so for the market cycle rules or guidelines if you're unsure assume it's a trading range and wait use the ema if it's 15 or 20 bars above the ema do not sell. If it's 50 to 15 to 20 bars below the EMA, do not buy. And what, what that means is I want to see, when I see this, that's an extreme example, but let's find something different here. I need to see closes. I want to see a close of, uh, completely below the EMA. So look right here. We had closes at the EMA, close at the EMA, close at the EMA, close at it. Now, why do you think it's important to understand that? Why does it matter if we get a close completely below the EMA versus a close below the EMA? Who can tell me? Why do we need a close completely below the EMA? The reason is it's a sign of strength. The EMA is a reflection and, and first, if we're going to talk about the, I'm going to draw it over here on our never ending whiteboard. Let's talk about the moving average. So who can tell me what is the moving average? In reflect in, I'm going to delete that because that is just terrible writing. So what is the moving average in relation to the very first topic I talked about today? Again, it's an average price, okay? And what's another word for average price? It's a fair price. Exactly. That's exactly it. Give me just one second here. Exactly. Great job. It's a fair price. So the moving average is a reflection of the fair 
price. And that is, it's very simple and it sounds simple, but that can save you a lot of trouble when it comes to trading. Moving average is a reflection of the fair price. And remember, the reason why we need to understand the fair price is the end of the market cycle is So how can the end of the market cycle be the fair price? The reason is, is actually pretty simple. Who can tell me? How is the end of the market cycle the fair price? Let's say I'm going to give it 10 seconds, see if anyone can answer it. It's in a trading range. Exactly. Because market is now in trading range. So if the market cycle, if the end of the market cycle is the fair price, why, who can tell me, why does the market cycle often go sideways in a tight band? In other words, let's go back to the very beginning here. Why does the, mar the market probes up and down? Let's think about that logic. Here's the market. The market cycle is complete. It's in a trading range. The objective of the market has been completed. Now, the object it's not done because as soon as it's going to probe up and down, and then when there's price discovery due to the fundamentals changing, the market is going to break to the upside or the downside. But the market's going to probe up and down in order to find what the fair price is. And because of that, for some reason, there's a timer on these slides. I'll make sure to fix that next time. But because of that, what's happening is this area here is going to always be resistance. This area here is always going to be support. So a trading range, we think of trading ranges as this right here. Let me go to the slide. Sell up here, buy down here. But for those of you that have been trading for a long enough time, you know that that's usually not what happens. What does the market do instead? The market forces you, take a little screenshot of this. Throw this over here. So if this is the end of the market cycle, market cycle, we know that the buy zone is here. Excuse me, the sell zone is there and the buy zone is somewhere down here. And the sell zone you know, somewhere up here. But the problem is most of the time, if the market's in a, if the, when the market figures out what the fair price is into the market cycle, so fair price, when that's been discovered, what happens is the market is going to try and create as tight of a spread as possible. So the market wants to, it has a range. It knows that the, the fair price is somewhere inside of this box over here. So it knows it's somewhere in here. And you have price going up, price going down. Think about a line chart. And eventually, the market, give me one second.
And because of that, the market is going to get squeezed tighter and tighter. And then the range starts to get smaller, 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 and then smaller. And who can tell me what is this pattern right here? And tell me, who can tell me what it is and why it occurs? I'm going to wait for about 20 seconds to see an answer. Exactly. It's a triangle. And a triangle, it is the market is getting squeezed into a fair price. And because of that, when the rain, if the market's probing up and down, up and down, up and down, and it starts to get too tight of a range, what happens is the market wants to know what's up here and what is down here. So should price go anywhere in this area? Should price go in this area? And then eventually there's a surprise. Let's say we get a big bear breakout like so, and then the market gets a pullback and it channels down and eventually rallies back into a new trading range down here. That seems, and, and let me ask you this for those of you, does this seem like an easy, does this concept make sense that the market is always in search of a fair price? If you can always keep that top of mind, you have to keep that top of mind and you always have to be thinking why the market's in search of a fair price. And the reason is what a lot of people do is they're always hopeful. Let's just go to a random day. So let's look at the next day. Everybody's hopeful that on any open, the market's going to get a strong upside breakout or a strong downside breakout. And what they want is the world, you know, a very strong trend. Most days, that is not likely. So let's take a look at some examples. And what I want everyone to practice in either tomorrow or the next time they're looking at the market, think from the perspective of the fair price. And the reason for that is you wanna remove your emotions from it. You wanna think objectively. So what do we have here? We had a spike, pullback, channel. And I'll talk more, and, and just to be clear with all this, I'm gonna talk more in detail about breakouts next session. So just get this out of the way real quick. This is what I want everyone to accomplish next week. In order for me to explain the market cycle, I really need to explain, I got to explain breakouts and better yet. So I want everyone to focus next week, watch all these videos. In other words, watch the breakout videos. And then next week, we're going to talk about breakouts. After we talk more about breakouts, I'm going to talk about leg counting. Once we talk about leg counting, we'll talk about channels and trading ranges. So even though I know I haven't discussed a lot as far as what do you do in the market cycle in each one of those phases, I want everyone to understand the large picture of the market cycle, then narrow down into the other categories. So the first thing I do on any open, look to the left, gap down, 
moving average below a lot of bars above it here below it a lot here so this is probably some kind of spike pullback channel phase if it is a channel phase then the market is probably going to do what what happens after a channel exactly it talks about exactly the market is going to form a trading range top of the trading range could be here it could be here so when you're in a channel the prior swing points are the targets gap bar one it's a wedge it's a trading range it's a rally but it's probably a trading it's a trading range pullbacks could be deep we're probably going to test up here probably going to test up here continuing to go sideways now what's happening well maybe the channel is continuing to go lower but if it does go lower what do we think is going to happen here if it gets down here there's probably buyers and then eventually the market's in a trading range here so we had a spike trading range sell off whole thing is a channel we can draw it with these lines here two things are going to happen we're going to break out of the channel and get a large measure move or we're going to test the top of the, of the we're going to test the prior lower highs and create a trading range and that leads me to another discussion so i want to talk about for a minute when you have a market cycle the market cycle starts with a big let me draw it in red to keep it simple the market cycle starts with what a bear breakout here then we get a pullback and then we get a channel phase and the market keeps channeling down like so so what is needed right here we have a spike and channel what is needed in order for the market to transition into a trading range what's the one thing else says when you're in a channel spike pullback channel there's one occurrence that's needed in order for the market to transition into a trading range one says reversal okay but expand on that major trend reversal trend line break yes all of those are true you need a trend line break there's the trend you need a trend line break but what do you need relative to the most recent lower high you need a test of the most recent lower high ideally you need to break above it so we need a breakout of the lower high and really we need a breakout of the major lower high and then eventually the market gets a we'll do this gets a strong bull breakout above the major lower high and then the market transitions into a trading range and then it pulls back and gets the second leg up and eventually test all the way back up here to the top of the channel and then after that happens this whole thing from here to here is now the new trading range and the end of the market cycle I like to think of these as this entire topic the market cycle goes back to right here breakout channel trading range it's kind of like a never-ending algorithm that just it starts here goes to channel goes to trading range and then it just loops back to a breakout and because of that 
this quote unquote algorithm of the market can never be broken because it's a never ending loop. Sometimes it's stronger and it takes a lot longer to get back to a trading range, but eventually it'll get back to a trading range. So the reason why I wanted to bring that up is you're in a trend, wait for a trend line break. In order to end the channel phase, write this down, make a note. So in order Who can tell me as I'm writing this down what's needed to end the channel phase? Exactly. A breakout of the most of the major lower high in this case to end, we'll call it a so end the channel phase, a breakout. above or below the major lower high or higher low must occur. This is another thing that is critical to understand about the market cycle. So whenever you're in the market cycle, you see a spike channel phase, one of these lower highs needs to get broken. New low, here's a high, new low, we need the market to go above here. And until it does, guess what? You're still in a channel. So look what's happening. We're still holding above it, new low, finally broke to the downside and look strong bull breakout but it's a possible lower high finally we came close and finally broke above it so we ended the channel phase i'm curious really quick is the whiteboard helping or do you find it distracting? I'll give that a couple minutes. I'll give that a couple seconds. And I'm going to read through some more questions here. Okay, so it's helpful. Therefore, if everyone likes it, I'll use the whiteboard more frequently. Someone asked, Adrian asks, so a channel can be followed by a breakout as well. Exactly. So let's document that. A channel, how does a channel operate? When we have a channel, So let's go back to the whiteboard. So we have, we'll keep drawing, we'll draw a bear channel just because, keep it simple. So we have a bear breakout. <clears throat> and the bear breakout gets a pause and starts to channel down. And maybe we look at this here and we look at it and say, yeah, it's a wedge. There's the wedge right here. So there's point one, point two, 
0.3, the market should rally and at least get two legs up half the distance of this overall wedge. So it should do this at a minimum and then decide whether to break out here or break out to the upside. However, let me, there we go. My whiteboard went away for a second. However, what percentage of the time, well, first off, let's, let's talk about what's the percentage chance that channels evolve into trading ranges. Who can answer that? What's the percentage chance that a, that a bear channel is going to evolve from this into this right here? Seventy percent, seventy-five. I'll take seventy-five percent. So, Tom, great job, great job, great job, great job. Overall, the main the main key is it's about seventy-five percent. Is it eighty? Is it seventy-five? More often than not, you get this where there's a seventy-five percent chance. Of, of what? TBTL, 10 bars, two legs, and a general rule of thumb, which I just realized this really got screwed up. General rule of thumb is this. So here's leg one, leg two, leg three, Erase this. There we go. So a good rule of thumb is 10 bars and two legs and half the bars in the wedge. So most channels form a wedge and when they form the wedge they usually get a rally and two legs up and a test of one of these highs here or here so of one of these highs either here or here now 25 percent of the time because obviously that's in the opposite of 75% of the time, instead of getting a successful wedge and two legs, what ends up happening is the market tries to rally, but then you get a strong breakout to the downside. Now, because we this is the 25% occurrence, what do we expect right here? So what do we expect when we get the LP, low probability, 25% bare breakout of the wedge? What do we get? Measured move, measured move, measured move. Okay, great. We were really quick to say measured move. Makes me very happy. Proves people have watched the video course. Next. Why? Who can answer why we get a measured move? And answer it in relation to this topic of today's session, the market cycle. So we get a measured move, that's correct. So we get something, here's the top, maybe here's the bottom, 
Measure and move down. Somewhere in this area. Maybe we get a couple of legs down and then the market starts to go sideways again. So why do we get a measured move? Reading the comments, 1R, days range. Not days range, major surprise, major surprise. What happens, why do trade, let's back up. Why do trading ranges When we think about this right here, this wedge here, this is actually a trading range. It's a transition point. So we had a spike down to here. We had a pullback. So in other words, we had a spike. We had a pullback. And then the pullback led to basically this whole thing being a channel. And when this channel occurs, what should occur is a trading range as a whole. So this box should do this right here and form a trading range. Instead, it did form a trading range, but instead of testing the upper portion of the range, it broke below the range. And because of that, the way I like to think about it is it's breaking out of the market cycle and it's breaking far below the bars to the left. In other words, it's resetting the market cycle is an easy way to sit, just think about it. So what's happening and the reason we get a measured move is that's why that's happening. So what's happening is reset of market cycle. Let's move this over here. So if we're getting a reset while I'm writing this, if we're getting a reset of a market cycle, why do we get two legs? So let's go back to right here. Let's find a bear breakout of a wedge. Here's a wedge, one, two, three. So you have a wedge bottom here. Why, why do we expect two legs? We broke below, we got a second, and we got a third. The reason is when you get a breakout below a wedge, it's breaking below a, tra a trading range, and it leads to two or three legs down in the opposite direction. In other words, a spike, pullback, channel, and then a reversal forming a trading range. So let me turn the screen off for a second. And let's talk about let's talk about this day over here. So we have a channel going into the prior day, and then we have a gap up and a bull breakout. And the bull breakout is it's a gap up, big bar. It's always in long, and we have follow through. But look to the left. It's continuation after a trading range, and. We've been in a bull trend since down here because we've been in a bull trend and we're going sideways and we're gapping up. It's still fair to say the market's always in long. So what's the one thing? If this is a bull rally, what's the one thing we need 
to end the bull rally. We need exhaustion, correct, but we also need a test of the, the most recent major higher low. Big bear bar, probably enough to make the market form a trading range, and the market often forms a trading range before it gets to the higher low. Big bear bar, what's the next thing we need? Follow through below the moving average. Consecutive bear bars breaking below the moving average. That is enough of a surprise to probably get its own second leg down. And you see what's happening? We have a second leg down here. Tight bear channel. We have a third leg down. So we have a one leg down, two legs down, three legs down. Because of that, we're probably entering, we're in a channel phase, and we're probably going to start to go sideways. But because this channel down is tight, we could easily rally for a bar or two, and this whole thing could be a pullback here that leads to a second leg. And you can see, sell off, sideways, another leg down. And look what happened right here. We have a rally. So think about the shape. Spike, pullback, channel phase, rally, testing the highs of the channel. But all this does is create a trading range. And when a trading range gets created, we're going to get a breakout, either down or up. So when you look at this rally and you look to the left, the reason why it's dangerous to often buy these bull bars to the upside is it's a trading range and you're buying in the middle. And if the market, if the trading range is a fair price, you're taking it, you're buying somewhere around the fair price. And that's why that happened. Big bear bar. Now, why would traders look to buy as this bar is going down? Because the market's in a trading range. So remember what we talked about? If the market's in a trading range, you have Can we hear it? We should hear sound. I'm going to give the sound just minutes. Okay, cool. Minor issue, but now we know how to fix it, so we can move forward. Let me make sure I'm on the right audio. It should be loud and clear. Okay, so back to where we were. Let me share my screen. Yeah, so right here. This rally is a, <clears throat> let's start with this. We have a bull breakout. However, breakouts pull back into trading ranges. So breakout, it pulls back and it starts to form a channel, which is now a trading range. Eventually, you get this. And what happens here is you get a surprise, but the surprise begins to test the bottom one third of the range. So what everybody does is this right here. And unless everybody starts complaining, I'm going to continue to use the whiteboard because I believe it can be helpful in explaining. So if we take a look at today's price action and we think about this bar right here, this big bear bar, what happens in trading ranges is this. It's called the vacuum effect. You have traders that will start, as this bar starts to go down, they start selling on the way down. And I like to think about it like this. We have, now you're going to have to follow me here because I'm going to start, I'm going to erase and redraw lines. So we have this box right here. And what happens is you have everybody, you have everybody buying below this bar, buying here, buying here, buying here. And they're buying as the bar is going down. 
But all of a sudden, what happens is these bulls, they get triggered, they scale in, they scale in. And they're doing that because they expect the market to snap back into the range. However, their stop's rather tight. And when the market just crashes through here, crashes through here, and then it keeps going lower, all of a sudden, all those bulls start doing this. Sell, sell, sell. They start quickly selling out of longs here, which causes the market to start crashing down further. Sell, sell, sell. But then at some point, zoom in here so we can see it. We can see all the, so the greens are buys, buy, 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 and then sell, 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 sell. Bear bulls reversing, bear shorting. Then what happens is you get down to something called the magnetic field of a trading range. In other words, the fair price. So you have the buy zone. Let's just say the sell zone somewhere up here. Nobody knew the market was in a trading range until this bar started forming. But as this bar started going down, it got in a certain location who can tell me where what is the location when you start buying in the buy zone this area right here is the bottom one third of the range lower third so the lower one third of the range This is where those bulls that were short that start losing, everybody starts selling, including the bears, and then it switches. Everybody starts buying in this area. So bulls are buying, bears are buying back their shorts, and that causes the market to snap back to the upside where everybody starts to sell again. <clears throat> so this leads to discussion. How do you identify the upper and lower one third of the range? You identify it by taking a look at the prior leg. So to identify the range in order to identify the buy and sell zone, you take a look at the prior leg. So what I like to look for is a rally. Maybe that's maybe this whole thing's the leg from here to here. This rally is, you can argue, the whole thing, leg one. Now it subdivides into smaller legs. So by subdividing, what I mean is one, two, and three. However, the whole thing is still leg one. Eventually, the market, everybody agrees, the market starts going sideways, maybe it breaks to the downside here, and everybody agrees that now this whole thing is a trading range. What I like to do is buy in the bottom one third. So how do you measure that? Take a measured move from the low to the high, find the bottom one third. In other words, find 33% or 60, or if you want, you can measure a 66% pull, pullback from the low to the high which will be somewhere around this area here. That creates the buy zone. Then eventually the opposite happens. So when we look at a breakout here, here's the low, here's the high. I know other platforms have more eloquent ways of doing this. This is one way you can do it with TradeStation. I normally just kind of eyeball it. 
but here's a way you can do it. So here's the low, here's the high. And you can see what happened. We came really close to the buy zone, the bottom third of the range, and we can quickly reverse back up. Now, here's the low, here's the high. You're back in the sell zone. So what's everyone going to do here? They're going to start selling. Here, back in the buy zone. People start buying. And they start scaling in. And then you can see it goes right back to the middle. So obviously, the worst place to trade is the middle of the range. Middle of the range, I like to call it no man's land. So if we look back to this area over here, there's the buy zone. We'll make this area up here the sell zone, which means some area in here is going to be the NTZ. NTZ. No trade zone. Just don't trade there. So what are some tail signs that the market is starting the trading range? Maybe this is kind of a little bit of a, we can make this kind of a precursor to next week. There's a lot of pieces to cover with the market cycle, but signs of a trading range If I can spell. So what are, let's think about a trading range. Trading range. One sign of a trading range is overlap. We think about overlap. And all of these are true. Signs of a trading range, counter trend traders making money. That is all true. But when, when I'm, whenever I'm defining something in the market, you can use things such as counter trend traders making money, but I really like things that are visual. And the reason why I like things that are visual is I want to be able to identify it. It needs to have a characteristic. So... So a sign of TR, trading range, is overlap. That's one big sign. Now, what does overlap create? Overlap cre basically ends, it does a few things. Remember what I talked about with major and minor surprises? Yes, there's confusion. There's uncertainty, CT, counter trend, traders make money. Those are all true, but I really want to focus on this one right here, overlap. And the reason why I want to focus on it is <clears throat> when you think about a, when you think about a breakout, in order for a breakout to break out of a trading range, so let's say we have this trading range right here. And lots of price moving up, lots of price moving down, up, down, and then it keeps going sideways. And eventually, we get this. We get a bull bar. And then we get a pullback. And then we get another bull bar. And then 
We got a small pull back here and then another bull bar. So think about what's going on right here. Why is overlap important to measure? Overlap's important to measure because of smaller time frames. I've got a chart that I'll show in just a minute. But when you have little overlap of a bar, when you have when the market has very little overlap, what it creates is this. It creates a rally, small pullback, rally, small pullback, rally, little overlap. And what happens is bears sell, scale in on the red areas, and then those bears get squeezed. And when they get squeezed, you get a big breakout. A big breakout. And the reason is those limit order traders have to avoid a loss. Let me turn this off for a second. I want to pull up. Another PowerPoint. Here we go. You've seen me show this slide. Most of you have seen this slide several times. This is a great example of how strong breakouts occur. And the reason bright strong breakouts occur the way they do, you have this big bear breakout here. And this is the market cycle. Spike, pullback channel, we have a trading range, and then you have this big breakout right here. <clears throat> you have limit order traders who bought the low of this bar, bar one. And you can see it on a one minute chart. They bought this low, this first bear bar. They scale in lower, scale in lower, and all of a sudden they get trapped. And the market will not allow them to get out. And if the market doesn't allow them to get out, then what happens is they get squeezed out of a trade. For those of you that have tried trading counter trend and you've tried limit order trading, you understand this importance. And I'm going to talk more about this subject in the upcoming videos. But the point is, it all comes back to the question of when you're thinking about the market cycle and signs of a trading range, what it comes back to is understanding this topic right here. Who is trapped if you've seen the old video course i think it's the old video course there's a and maybe it's in the new one but al mentions in poker if you don't know who the mark is the joke is that you're the mark so in other words when you look at a market and you do not know who the trap traders are you're probably the trap trader so overlap, what overlap does is it prevents traders from getting trapped. That's why characteristics of a strong breakout, some of the best breakouts are this. I've shown this slide numerous times. Bull bar, another bull bar, another big bull bar, another big bull bar. And what you notice is there's not a lot of overlap and it squeezes traders. If you sold the high of this bar and scale in once or twice, any of you traders that have made that mistake, you know the pain of holding and then getting out up here. You cannot do that. So let me go back to here about this example of signs of, of a trading range. What I like to measure is when I think about trading ranges, I want to see overlap. And whenever, so let's take a look at some examples. Rewind the chart somewhere. And let me see something here. So I'm looking for a specific example. And this example works good enough. So you have a big sell off right here and a rally and what happens is 
you have traders who start buying. So let's say, I'll just grab a screenshot. Throw it on the whiteboard. I'd rather draw this to explain it. Trap traders create the market. Trap traders are what create basically breakouts. And you can see it over here. There's bulls. There's some unfortunate bull who bought this low right here. And what does Al say? Most of the time, you know, 80% of the time, you can buy here, buy above a bull bar, somewhere down here, you know, maybe above this bar, and you can avoid a loss by getting out break even at the midpoint. 60% of the time, you can buy here, scale in, and get out at your original entry up here. Now, because of that, what do you think happens to the traders who buy here and scale in. Well, they're obviously disappointed. Therefore, they're not going to buy again at that same price level. It creates resistance. That's how that's why double tops always lead to resistance and double bottoms lead to support. Now, what happens in a trading, what happens with the market is you form a trading range and you have limit order bulls who they bought this low here, and they make money. They buy this low here, and maybe they make money, but then maybe they get trapped. So let's say right here, you, you buy. So you buy right here, and you tried to get out break even. You tried to make a profit up here, but you didn't get filled. So you tried to buy. You tried to sell, you couldn't get filled. And then you try and scale in. You scale in once, you scale in twice. The traders that were smart got out, break even right here. If they didn't and they held, look what happened. When the market went lower, When the market ended up going lower, it created gaps. And a lot of those traders were forced to start selling out of longs. And the reason, whenever you're buying with limit orders and scaling in, you have to be quick to exit. Because there's always the risk of this happening. Your entry would have been up here. And the market would have fallen from 83, basically 80 points. And if you bought, scaled in, scaled in, and you never kept scaling in, you would take a massive amount of pain. Eventually, you could get outbreak even up here. Most traders wouldn't do that. <clears throat> so in order to think about the market cycle, let's kind of hit a few. I want to hit on a few key topics for the market cycle. I don't know why it's doing that. There we go. So a breakout. We've talked about how the breakout phase of the market cycle. We have first the breakout phase. Strong breakouts. What we want to see here is Trapped traders. The easiest way to see trapped traders is big change in the market cycle. Can everyone hear me okay? Someone said no sound. I want to make sure the sound's working. It looks like it's working. And when I'm talking, yeah, the sound's working just fine. So we're all good. But anyways, you have 
a breakout and trap traders. And the easiest way to see if there's trap traders is a big change in the market cycle. So why is that? Why does a change in the market cycle lead to trap traders? Because at every stage of the market cycle, so let's think about the market cycle. Here, traders trade differently at each market cycle. So when we have a market cycle, in the breakout stage, traders are betting on betting on momentum. When you have the channel phase, you have an increase in value trading. What that means is traders don't want to, and then you have obviously a decrease. Let me just add that, a decrease in momentum. Because remember, a, tra a channel is a transition point. You have a decrease in momentum. And then eventually what happens is you form a trading range, TR, where it's 100% value. That's actually not true. I mean, obviously it's never going to be a hundred percent. So let's, let's, that's not fair to say it's going to be 80 to 99% value, something like that. And what I mean by that is the market is probing up and down in search of value. So what you want to see is you want to see a breakout that in the trading range phase that traps the value traders. If all the value traders get trapped, in other words, if all of the traders here that were betting on a trading range get trapped by this breakout, then that's a sign that the market's going to go a lot higher because they were trading value. In other words, they're selling, scaling in, scaling in, scalping out, buying, scaling in, scaling in, scaling in, scalping out. So the bears, they sold, they scaled in, they scaled in, they scaled in, and now they're getting squeezed out of a strong trade. Whenever you're selling and scaling in, you've got to be really quick to get out, especially when your risk reward's bad. And we'll talk all about those pieces later on. So a breakout, you need trap traders. Then... What happens is you get a channel phase. And that channel phase, so this is the next phase. What happens on the channel phase is that you have traders trend traders begin to do what? What do, be, what do trend traders begin to do in channels? They begin to exactly take profits. Really, it's partial profits. And you have an increase in CT, counter trend, traders, making money. So a way to think about that is you have a rally you have a bull breakout here, bull breakout and then a second leg Nobody wants to buy at the new high. They want to buy around 50%. So they want to buy the pullback to the second leg. Bull breakout. Nobody wants to buy above the prior breakout point because they expect it to get retested. Bull breakout. 
Nobody wants to buy the prior breakout point, but what do we say about this example? It's a wedge, one, two, three. Therefore, 75% chance at the market is going to test down. So wedge, one, two, three, 75% chance test at the bottom of the range or the bottom of the trading range. So what happens is counter trend traders start to make money. Therefore, and breakout points close until eventually you get a trade range and the key for the trading range is I'm going to assume bull trend prior lower highs Higher, higher lows get tested. And this is because a channel is a TP so it's a transition point from breakout to trading range. Can you explain the one, two, three count from the wedge? I counted five, sure. But in order to explain it, why don't we just add it to the whiteboard? Here is the chart we were just looking at. And we have a breakout. So here we have, and to state the obvious, I'm, I've got to look down on a tablet in order to write on this whiteboard. So that's why I'm looking down half the time. But you have a breakout here. Breakout. And So breakout, you can call this leg one. Do it like this. There's leg one. There's one, two, three, four. So what's common in wedges? Who can, who can help? Who can help answer this? How can this be a wedge if there's four legs up? Well, one of the reasons is it's really common for wedges to break above the third leg and fail. And you can say one, two, three, where this is one, two, three, and this is more or less a failed breakout of a wedge. There's nothing wrong with saying that. Where so failed breakout of wedge that logic works, or you can say. this is the first leg, this is the second, and that's the third. 
Therefore, the wedge is really right there. That is a possibility as well. But the key is whenever you see a rally that's not breaking far above the wedge, there's a greater risk of pullback. <clears throat> I would like to, as far as typing in a text box, I'd like to do that. But the problem is the sound of the keyboard and the, it would take more time to do that, unfortunately. So as far as leg counting, we will talk more. Again, my thought is, as far as the following sessions, if I'm just kind of drafting what I want to talk about. So for next session topics, here's kind of my overall thought with this. So as far as future sessions, one, we have to discuss breakouts and understand that. Then we need to really understand leg counting and then three we'll talk more about channels trade ranges and then reversals so i'll take a poll real quick who would rather hear who would rather talk about Breakouts or channels first, or excuse me, out of these two right here, do you want me to talk about it in this order? Breakouts next week, leg counting on the following week, or would you rather me talk about leg count followed by breakouts? Okay, I'm going to assume we're going to go with the initial. And the reason why I'd rather talk about it here is we need to understand breakouts really well in order to understand leg counting. And the reason, as I've hinted at, is leg one, if you get a strong enough breakout, let me show it over here. If you get a breakout like this, it can keep resetting itself. If you get a breakout like this, one, two, three, it can reset itself over and over. So if you see this and you're trying to count legs, you're just going to get crushed. If you see this right here, you're going to get in a lot of trouble trying to count legs. One other thing I forgot to mention, and that is whenever you have trouble counting So whenever you have trouble with understanding the market cycle, I've had plenty of people ask me in the past, I have trouble reading the market cycle. What they're telling me is they really have trouble understanding leg counting. And there's really one reason for this. One of the reasons they have trouble with counting legs is Trading ranges. Trading ranges, they make things difficult for one reason. And they make it difficult for, because of higher time frames. When I look at a trading range, there's several ways to draw legs. There's a wedge. Here's a channel, bull channel. Here's a good example. We have a high, high. I can draw a parallel right here. 
and create a bull channel. I can draw the parallel up here. That's a bull channel. That's a bull channel. I can draw a bear channel. So there's a lot of ways I can draw lines. When you're in a small pullback trend environment, like this, really only one, there's only so many ways you can draw the trend. You can choose different angles and slopes to the upside, but how can I really draw a bear trend? I can't. And because of that, I can't really draw a bear trend that well. What that means is the market's mostly one-sided. On an hour, on a higher time frame, 60-minute chart, 30-minute chart, it's going to be a micro channel. Here, on a higher time frame, 60-minute, 30-minute chart, it's not. It's just going to be big bars. This is going to be one move down, followed by a reversal up. On a higher time frame, it's a bear breakout and reversal intra bar creating a doji bull breakout reversal down maybe it's a two bar reversal maybe it's a reversal with the big tail closing on its low so one of the reasons why traders have trouble understanding the market cycle is their inability to go to a higher time frame and they're confused trading ranges are going to confuse you and the reason they're going to confuse you is if trading ranges don't confuse you, if trading ranges do not cause confusion, then nobody will buy back and forth. So they're confusing because Because of the goal of a market, in order to create a tight spread on a market, one must force one must force transactions to occur. In other words, price transparency. Now, if you want to sell a house, it's really easy to go to Zillow and you can see every transaction in the neighborhood for years. That price transparency makes things, <clears throat> it forces, it makes things confusing. So let me take a look at some questions here. Can you clarify ways to avoid analysis paralysis when using multiple time frames to understand the market cycle, particularly when looking for a trade on the lower time frame. Okay, let's see here. Yes, these webinars are recorded. It's on YouTube. So you will be able to see the recording on YouTube. Question, Brad, can you clarify ways to avoid analysis paralysis when using multiple time frames to understand the market cycle, particularly when you're looking for a trade on the lower time frame? Great question. So who can answer this question for me? What do we think? So analysis, analysis paralysis is typically created by an overload of information analysis crowd paralysis is typically created when one has far too much information to look at the simple answer one t f in other words one time frame easiest way now if you want to understand market cycle with one time frame do this. If you want to trade a five minute chart, plot a 221 EMA on the five minute, and that will give you a 60 minute EMA or moving average. So if I want to, if I want to limit analysis paralysis and understand context, one of the things I can do 
is let's try this. So 12 slash 31. I'm going to pull up a part here. And one thing we can do is I forget what the number is. Maybe it's 60, give or take. Close of this bar, 95, 94. So 60 gets you really close to a 15 minute moving average. If I look right here, so if we go back over here to 1245, the moving average on the 15 minute chart is Let's say it is 4801 and a quarter here, 4801 and some change. So you can use a pretty much 60 input of 60 to get you a 15 minute moving average on a five minute chart. But that's what I would look at is generally use something like a 15 minute moving average. And then if the market's above a lot of bars here, it's bullish. Therefore, if it collapses, and test near the moving average, it may start to go sideways. But what I, to answer your question, though, in an easier way, what I like to do is limit my time frames. When I trade, I have one chart in front of me and a price ladder. And I'm going to trade using that chart. So this is what I'm going to look at. If I'm going to look at crude oil, I'm going to trade usually watch a 15 minute chart of crude oil, but this is the chart I'm gonna trade. And I'm gonna keep it really simple. We have a big sell off, but I'm gonna to look to the left. It's a trading range. I don't wanna sell low in a trading range. There's probably buyers down here. A price ladder is just a matrix. So that's all that means. But that overall is how I would trade looking at a chart. But analysis paralysis is typically when you have too many charts and you end up not being able to decide what to do. What people commonly do is they want to sell, they want to buy on the way up. So they flip to a one minute chart. Such as let's find the chart. They flip to the one minute chart and they start buying on the one minute. But then what they end up doing is they start trading the one minute and then they start getting chewed up. So what I would do is just focus on one time frame and one chart. Oh, apologize. So what I was saying is what people do, they go to a one minute chart because they want to enter early. So a good example is something like this, 10.05. So what they do, they see this bear breakout here and they want to sell, but they also know it's a trading range on this time frame. So they end up selling during this bar and they think, yeah, it's a bear breakout. You know, I'm fast to respond. I'll just sell and manage the trade and they're unable to and before they know it they get confused and they shorted here maybe they weren't quick enough to scale in get out break even and next thing they know they're managing this trade on a one minute chart rather than the five minute chart they had a plan on the five minute to enter and the only way for me what i do the only way i'm going to use smaller time frames to enter is if there's <clears throat> I use an example maybe often if I'm looking at let's say a 60 minute chart this is a common way what I'll do if I want to trade forex if I want to trade crude oil that's a good example and we're in a bear we're in a bull channel and we're breaking out to the upside on crude oil and I think okay bull breakout possibly bull breakout of a channel looks questionable this should fail but rather than just sell at the market 
maybe I want to wait and start to see momentum. I might go to a 15 minute chart of crude oil and I'm already aware of what I'm looking for. So if I look at crude oil, this was back on the 12th. Here's the 12th. Here's the strong rally. I might wait and see two consecutive bull bear bars and look to sell or sell pullback or so I look to sell, maybe stop up there based on the higher time frame, taking a chance I could get in early. But generally, that's going to mess you up if you trade that way. So you have to be really careful about doing that. So overall, I'm curious, who does everyone understand? Let's go back to basics here. Are we all clear on what the next session is going to cover? In other words, let's just keep it simple. Next session covers this. Videos to watch. Here's the following. And watch breakouts. You can watch the leg counting. I'm going to discuss breakouts tomorrow for next Tuesday at this same time, four o'clock central time. So watch the breakout section and we're going to get pretty involved with breakouts in order to under, again, in order to understand the market cycle, there we go. In order to understand the market cycle, we have to understand a little bit of everything. In other words, I cannot explain I can explain the market cycle and the key pieces, but I cannot explain how to trade the market cycle without first understanding the market cycle, breakouts, and leg counting. Then, once we understand those key pieces, we can start diving deeper into each subject. We can dive deeper into breakouts and understand how breakouts lead to second legs. We can dive deeper into channels and understand how channels are the transition point between a trend to a trading range, and then we can understand how a trading range operates. And all of that revolves around price discovery. The market is in a fair price. As I mentioned on the first portion of this video, it's in a fair price. The market's going sideways, so it's probing up and down, going up and down, going up and down until there's price discovery. And you get a strong breakout and the market's got to search. It's got to keep probing new highs to see, has it reached the fair price? But again, the webinar, the next one will be, you'll find out more information about it. It'll be at four o'clock PM central time. Let's just verify the date on the 23rd of January, seven days from now at 4 PM. And the topic is going to be breakouts. <clears throat> So watch the breakout videos, spend time thinking about the breakout videos. And this video is recorded. There are a lot of people that asked, was the video recorded last time? You can find the video on YouTube. So go to the Brooks Trading Course YouTube channel and, there, and in there, you'll find the recording of this video. You may have to wait for a little bit because YouTube's got to process the video before it makes it available. But I would imagine in about an hour from now, you will see it. If anyone, is, does anyone want the PDF to the whiteboard? I'll give that a second. And then second, if let me know in the comments if you like the whiteboard and I'll start using it more and we'll find a good system on how to use it. So I'll give those comments just a second. So PDF, yes. What about the whiteboard? Do we like the whiteboard? Do we not like the whiteboard? The reason why I like the whiteboard is there's moments it's, it's helpful if you can have everything written down and better see what I'm trying to explain rather than moving quickly on a chart. Okay, great. So overall, thanks everybody for watching. We'll have a session next week and it'll cover breakouts. 
the one thing I would ask everyone to do this week is continue to spend time thinking about the market cycle. So look at charts. Don't worry necessarily how to trade the chart, but worry, think through the market cycle in terms of fair price. Okay, the market's balanced. It's going up and down. It's balanced in this area, going up and down. Now it's broken to the upside, therefore price discovery. It's trying to locate the fair price. And if there's one thing I would tell everyone, remember, the market is always in search of the average price. That's the number one goal. Okay, thanks everybody for watching, and I will talk to everybody very soon.